Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Christine Ann. Christine, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, it's great having you. Thank you for your time. Christine, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I am from Arizona. Not originally. I'm a military brat, but I made my life here in Arizona. I really like it. I have four sons, and I've been married for about 27 years now. I'm an emergency medical technician. I recently became a paramedic. I'm an author, and I truly enjoy being out in the great outdoors. I just seem to thrive when I'm out and Mother Nature. It's one of the biggest thrills of my life. So that's basically just me. I'm actually a pretty simple country girl. (laughs) Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. And I'm jealous. You're out there in Arizona. Yeah, we're about to head into a long, cold winter out this way, but not you. It's going to be nice out there, even in December and January. After you have the encounters you're going to tell us about tonight, you did a lot of research on dogmen. What did you learn about them that surprised you most? I think what surprised me the most is how far back the sightings actually go. And I was absolutely shocked to find out there's more than one type of dogman. Even though I had surmised for myself, based on what I had experienced, actually hearing and being able to put it to like faces and such helped me a lot to comprehend better what I had seen. They're still left with a lot of questions. It spurred a genuine interest in cryptids overall. I've read many books now, and I would like to be able to continue to write about dogmen and dogmen experiences because I thought it was a cool subject. But what surprised me the most was um, people seem to encounter them, but they walk away. And they're frightened. Yes, I was. I was terrified. (laughs) I'm not going to lie. But they walked away from it. And the idea of being able to walk away from something that big, it's amazing. And I'm happy to be able to be on your show and report, I'm here, i seen this. Do you understand what I mean? Oh, yeah, I definitely do. And yeah, being able to walk away from the experiences, that sure does beat the alternative, definitely. For a lot of eyewitnesses, Christine, the more they study dogmen, the worse the news gets. Is that how it was for you, or was it different? I had read about a couple of encounters that didn't end as well where they suspect it was a dogman attack that had gone, I'm going to say rogue for lack of a better word, because you have the uh, rogue theory of sharks that was around for years. But um, those ones that didn't end quite as well, I had to wonder secretly, knowing what I do about animals in general, because you have to keep in mind, I've been in the woods my entire life. And I know you raise a gun at an animal, it's going to come after you. You go too close to its young, it's going to come after you. You're in its hunting territory, it's going to run you off. But if you get confrontational with that animal, it's going to be confrontational with you. And that's not going to end well. It's not going to end well for you. So those ones kind of scared me a little bit. But I had wondered, and I know it sounds cold-blooded, but I wondered what the human had done to upset the animal. I hope the encounters that you're talking about didn't actually involve dogmen attacking people, but Yeah, it's entirely possible. You say you've always had a knack for wandering off into the woods because of your love for nature. After Mm -hmm. having the four encounters you're going to tell us about tonight, have you given that up or do you still like to do that? No, I still uh, will grab my fishing pole and head on off. The last time I went fishing with my husband, I caught a shadow over on the other side of the lake. And I said to him, and I quote, honey, is that a really big dog or a cat? Now, I say that to you, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? He thought I made a kitty cat. No, I made a mountain lion. And that's what it was. It was a mountain lion coming down to get something to drink. 
that my behavior has not changed at all. Am I more aware? Absolutely. I am more aware of my surroundings. I carry my nine mil with me and I actually have it loaded now, which before I just had speed loaders or a clip for my weapons, but now I actually carry one that's loaded just to be on the safe side. Yeah, well, that's never a bad idea. And while I hate the idea of you having those four encounters, I am glad that there was at least a positive aspect that came out of that. Like you said, you're more aware when you're out there, so I guess at least that's a good thing that came out of it, like I said. What's the most frightening thing that's happened to you in the woods that wasn't Dogman-related, Christine? <laughs> I went camping a few years back with my grandparents where they were still alive, and I had gotten up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I guess a bear had wandered into the campground. They trapped me in the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> How long were you in there? Baby. I was 22 or so. No, I was in my 20s. It was before I had kids. So I'm going to say 22, 23 max. And I stayed at the um, outhouse practically all night with this thing just going around. <laughs> so it was, it was terrible. I was so terrified. And I don't know what you know about West Virginia bears, but they're not really overly big. But like you said, they got big teeth and they got claws, so they can seriously hurt you. So I was not leaving that outhouse until I was sure it was gone. <laughs> yeah, I can't say I'll blame you at all. Your first two encounters happened in West Virginia when you were a kid, but your last two happened in Arizona after you were an adult. How much of an effect did those first two encounters have on your development, in your opinion? I don't think it really hit home what I had seen because I was young and because I wasn't certain about what I seen. It was like, I think I might have mentioned this in our first interview. My first reaction is, gosh, that's a really weird looking bear. But then it saw the pointy ears and its eyes and its muzzle and it's like, or not. <laughs> and the first encounter, too, I was seriously hurt because I was me. And it's par for the course at that age. But it didn't leave as bad of a mental stain, for lack of a better word, as the later ones did. Because here I am, an adult. I have an adult mind. My mind's fully developed now. And I see these two large animals. And they're much larger than what I've seen. And they terrified me. And I was just like, this can't be real. But it was very real. and. I think the realization really hit me hard after that last encounter. I needed to do some research. I needed to know what this thing was because I refused to accept even the remote possibility it could be a werewolf. But it looked so much like a werewolf that that's where my mind went. But two, as a child, or you know, being in that teen years, there was a brief curiosity too because I'm staring at a dog that's bigger than I am at four foot eleven. And it's down on all fours, but there was something different than about a dog, too, and its face. And it took me a while to figure out what that was. And it wasn't until I was doing my research, I said, oh, there it is. I see it now. And then it hit home what was different about those encounters, which we'll talk about when we get into talking about the encounters themselves. Well, I hate the fact that you've had those encounters, but I'm glad that at least you're still able to function, especially after having that last encounter. But having said that, Christine, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. So as I mentioned, I love being outdoors, and I have a tendency to wander off. <laughs> and I'll be gone for quite some time. I pack my little lunchbox, stick it in my backpack, and just head off into the woods. In West Virginia, you have very dense forest at places, big briars. We actually have a place called Piction because you're picking your shins, trying to get all the barriers off. It's a cute little name, small little town, or at least it used to be. And I was up visiting relatives, and my younger brother and I had decided to go vine swinging. As a kid, I spent a lot of time in the emergency room because of stunts like this. And it was a beautiful day out. It was summer, and he had come up to visit with me as I was visiting a different relative that he wasn't related to. And we hiked off a vine. Well, the thing is, and I probably did not mention this when we talked before, my brother and I had a deal that 
he would cut the vine for me because he didn't trust me to do it myself because I didn't know different tree structures and stuff like that. And I guess I picked a bag and fine and I chopped through it and we were vine swinging for quite a while. And then I got up there one time to swing out and I swung up pretty far and the whole thing just broke the tree, the vine, everything. And it's a pretty steep mountain. I was lucky in that the tree went one way and I went the other way with the vine, but I still ended up tumbling for quite some time before I ran into a rock. I don't know if I was knocked out for any length of time or anything like that, but I was pretty seriously hurt. And when I first opened my eyes, it was pretty much this really disgusting smell. It smelled like I compared it to rotted hamburger meat because that was the first thing that came to mind when I was little. And it was very potent. And I finally managed to get myself upright a little bit. It was extremely painful, which told me I had broke some bones. And I look over, and there's this huge dog staring back at me. And I was four foot eleven at the time, and this thing was bigger than I was, considerably. It had like a lightish brown coat, a little bit of white on the chest, but it was mixed in. The brown was mixed in with the white. It didn't seem like it was overly shaggy but I wouldn't say it was short haired. It, it was still kind of longish. It just wasn't like overly long. Um, I couldn't see its eyes from where I was. I think the thing that stood out the most for me was it had like kind of like a hyena like face. Its jaws were like really big, but in comparison to its body, the head was huge compared to the little body. Its body was kind of smallish, in comparison to the head and its pointy little ears. Uh, I shouldn't say little ears because they weren't so little. He looked like he needed to grow into his ears, for lack of a better word for that. And when he first saw me, he just tilted his head off to one side and was just kind of checking me out. And I was checking him out, or her. And um, it was just like that for a while. And then the dogs came down, two great big dogs that were my relatives. and. Um, they were barking at it, and that's when it stood up to its full height, and I could see how big it actually was. I estimate it was probably between, um, it was um, between, I would say, a little close to six feet, six feet and a half tall, and it didn't come near me. It just stood up, and the dogs would go so close to it and then back off, but they were like on either side of me, and we just pretty much stared at each other, but that smell was like really obnoxious. I don't know if it was coming from the animal or from something else. And this is going to sound strange, but part of me was curious to know what it was because of my age and because I've been out in the wilderness almost my entire life. And I always get thrilled when I get to see a new animal, even today, out in the wild. And a part of me was terrified because when it stood up, it looked like a werewolf. <laughs> but with a hyena head, and I, I wasn't sure what it was. It had, like, these little spots here and there, too, which I didn't know what to make of. But then I heard the rescuers calling my name, and it heard them, and it just disappeared. About the time they got there, the last I seen of it was when I was being lifted up. I seen it just peek out and then just take off through the woods, and that was the last I seen of it. Now, after this encounter... And it's important that I should tell you this. I was a little shaken up. I was so uncertain about what I had seen. And I had heard the people who had come down to rescue me mention that they found a den of some sort and that had the missing piglets in it and some of the cats and, and other things that had gone missing in the neighborhood, supposedly. And I overheard my relatives talking later about I had to have seen something down there because I was really scared. And I was to a point, kind of afraid. I didn't want to go back outside. And I certainly didn't want to go back out at night, even though this happened in the daytime, probably about mid-afternoon. There was a part of me that when I got out of the hospital, I just absolutely did not want to go far from the yard. I was partly afraid of seeing it again and partly curious to know what it was. But I did overhear them say that when they went back to explore the den it had been completely destroyed 
And I thought that was interesting at the time. And even as an adult, I still find that part interesting. My second encounter, I was not doing well being up with my other relatives. So they sent me down to my grandparents where my, my younger brother was staying. And I felt relatively safe. I was not in the same area. I didn't think, I don't like to call them monsters because I don't really think of them as monsters. I call them creatures. And I felt relatively safe after being in the yard and playing for a while and, and getting back into normal life routine to do uh, errand for my grandmother, which was to take some food up to one of our neighbors who was very elderly. She had recently lost her son in, in wartime in the military. I was never quite sure what happened. I just remember the big yellow ribbon on the door. And she was a widow, too. And she used to tell the most beautiful stories of the roaring 20s. That'll give you an idea how old she is and, unfortunately, how old I am. <laughs> and uh, I used to love to go up there. And I felt on the way up. It had just rained. It was a beautiful summer day. The clouds were just there enough to keep the sun off of you, but the trees are really thick in through that area too. And you can see like wild roses and daisies and all these pretty flowers growing. There was just this beautiful scent in the air. And um, it was just very calming. It was a very nice walk up there, except I got past a particular homestead. I started feeling like I was being watched. And that feeling wouldn't go away. And I consider when I was up at the neighbor's house calling my grandfather and having him come and get me. But then I decided I was probably being jumpy as being, as being silly. And so I went ahead and collected everything that needed to go back from the time I, they had taken food up to the, a few days before. And on the way back, I, I immediately felt that feeling of being watched. And it wouldn't go away. And it just kept getting more and more intense. And I was coming around the post office, and all of a sudden, this big tom turkey flies over my head like a 747, scares me half to death. I barely made it to the road in time for it to clear my head. And um, I, I, of course, I started laughing. It's like, of course, it, it, it was a turkey falling me in the woods. <laughs> you know, it sounded perfectly reasonable. But when I get myself back up, I look over into the trees because I heard, I heard something snap. And it sounded heavy. And I look up and it's just staring at me. It's this dogman, this werewolf like creature, and I really hate to call them that. It's behind the tree, but kind of not all the way. And all I could tell was that its eyes were yellow. It had some pointy ears. Its ears were different than the first ones in that there were, there were little tufts of extra hair here and there. Like it was matted or something, but you could also have that that same type of smell. Um, it was very potent when it came a little bit closer, and as it came more into to view from the tree or more around the tree, I could see that it was on two legs, which terrified me instantly because my mind instantly went to werewolves because I just seen the movie American Werewolf in London or Silver Bullet. I don't remember which, but I just seen one or the other. And um, I suddenly was aware of werewolves, period. Before then, it was just vampires I was afraid of. I was a very odd child. <laughs> and um, I had one look at it, and I just took off running. And I ran into my aunt's yard and then into my grandparents' yard and into the house, and I felt safer. All I can remember really about the way he he or she looked was that it was much much bigger than the first one somewhere between seven seven and a half feet tall maybe bigger and its stance was different um its legs were like further apart than the first ones have been but it might have been because it was actually on the hillside itself it wasn't in like like the first dog man was in a flattened area whereas this one was actually on the hillside itself so that might have interrupt it, how you perceive height and, and size. And I first time I actually saw the bottom part of, of, of its feet and whatnot, and just kept thinking it's very dog-like, not 
not what I, I would have expected it to, to look like. Um, but one thing I couldn't tell very well because of the trees is what color it was. It blended in really well with the trees. Um, so it's probably either a reddish brown or a dark brown color. Um, I didn't see any white except for those little tufts of hair that were on top of its ears, which I thought was really weird looking because of the way it was kind of like on the inside and along the, the um, outside. And um, unlike the first time I did notice the teeth temporarily and the way they, they the front part seemed to hang down a little bit more than the bottom ones protruded. So like I said, I just took off. I was really terrified. And um, it got to the point where I was having so many nightmares that my grandparents decided that I needed to go home back to Arizona sooner rather than later. And my third encounter was actually here in Arizona. Uh, we're talking 2,000 something miles away and probably 30 something years from that day. I was finishing up recertifying for EMS, emergency medical services as an EMT. I let my, um, license lapsed because I got tired of seeing the same thing all the time. It was like playing chess. You know, some calls ended really good, some not so good. And those not so good ones were starting to weigh heavy on my mind. And I was driving home, I was driving down the main street the least to my house, which is in a very dense forest area. And I was staying with my grandma. She's technically not my actual grandmother because both of them passed away years ago. But she's like 89 or so, and um, she's been my best friend ever since I moved to this area. Um, her great-grandson, our great-great-grandson, and my son went to school together. And um, I took care of her through four or five surgeries and various other crucial moments in her life. And when my husband and I had separated, she took me in, and I lived with her. I was driving down the main road leading to our house and I was really fortunate that I seen the deer coming across the road when I did. There was a whole herd of them and it was like they were fleeing for something and I picked up on that instantly and I just assumed it was a coyotes because there's a lot of coyotes in that area usually. It's just we hadn't heard them lately. We didn't know why we suddenly stopped hearing them, but we did. And um we noticed, too, that there weren't as many rabbits as there used to be. It used to be in the early mornings, you see rabbits everywhere. Late evening, or as the sun goes down, rabbits everywhere. And suddenly you weren't seeing quite as many. We weren't seeing quite as many pickery or um, javelina as we usually did. But the deer population was still good and, and hardy and out there. And th these guys looked like they were fleeing from something. So I stopped before I hit one of them, and I was watching them going across the road, but then a great big buck, I noticed he had his head turned back the way they were, had come from, and he snaps right into my F-150. And next thing I know, this big, black, hairy arm reaches out, and it had claws about two inches to three inches long, and it plucks him off my, my truck, and then he comes around and just bites into him, and I see that he has his ears kind of back. He has all these teeth and this long protruding nose. And I know right away, I've seen this before. I just, I couldn't place where I had seen it to give you an idea of how much time it actually does heal these type of things. He splattered blood all over my truck and just took this deer right off and started struggling him down towards the bridge. Well, I had to cross the bridge to go home, and I was like, well, I'm not doing that. So I did something really stupid, and I really, honest to God, do not recommend this to anybody. But I stuck the car in reverse because I had already peed myself and everything. Because when he took that bite out, I swear he rolled an eye back and looked at me, and it creeped me out. Now, I, I knew he was really big as he was heading towards the, the bridge because he was extremely muscular. And, um, his legs, he, he walked kind of funny, but he, he was definitely on two legs. And it was blowing my mind away that he was walking on two legs, half carrying, half dragging this deer that he still had his mouth into. And it terrified me. And so I hauled my hind end back up 
the way I had come in reverse. I drove my truck in reverse until I got to a road I could turn onto. And then I didn't know what to do. I mean, I couldn't go home with this thing running around. So I went up to the gas station. I tried to calm myself down. I eventually called my husband to see if I could go over to his house. And, you know, he, of course, said yes. He, he could hear the fear in my voice. He knew something was wrong. And you could probably hear the fear in my voice now because I'm not doing a good job of hiding it. And I went to his house. I got as close to the door as I could, went in. And the first thing I did is I went and checked on my boys, locked all the windows and everything, and um, gave them each a big hug and a kiss. And then I went into the bed and shook like a rock for practically until morning. And my husband woke me up and going, what did you hit? And I, 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 it took me a while to orient myself. I said, oh, I didn't hit anything. A deer hit me. And he's like, that's not a deer. Deers don't leave black hairs like this. And he had this big clump of hair that he took from my grill. As, and um, I went out to show him that there was blood splatter all over the, my truck and a big dent for where the, the male deer had hit. And he was confused. He, he couldn't um, put it all together. And I, I told him what I had seen. And, of course, he didn't believe me. My husband's a very scientific mind, and he just said it wasn't likely, and we left it at that. It was not worth arguing about or anything. But my fourth encounter is the one that it's going to stay with me a while. Um, I still have nightmares quite frequently about dogmen, and sometimes when I hear um, a sound that doesn't quite match up with the coyote, I wonder if it's out there still. My guess would be it is still out there. I had stayed up late one night with Grandma watching Josh Brolin movies. We watched No Country for Old Man and um, Only the Brave about the uh, 19 firefighters that passed away at the Urinal fire. And uh, I was going up to my loft. I was staying in the loft apartment then. And I was going up there. And the loft is mostly glass. I had taken most of the windows and cover them up with blankets. I had I had taken some old parts of this wall unit and put it up over the main window near the door. And I had like a little armoire that I used to center off a chunk of that area just for me that made me feel safe and, and cuddled, for lack of a better term. And um, it was my habit that before going to bed, I'd go outside. Indulge in a little nicotine. But just as I was about ready to spark up, I heard something coming up the tree. And it sounded big. And um, we had had some problems with the mountain lion. And I just assumed that's what it was. I don't remember if I turned the light off or if it hit the light when it came up. But I barely made it back inside before I was able to lock the door, throw the bolt. And I was expecting to hear those mountain lion sounds. Instead, I hear something I've never heard before. I heard something like a cross between a dog and a wolf. I suddenly felt like I was literally living a scene out of a silver bullet. I was terrified. But another part of me was curious. I had to know for sure what was making that sound. So I crept over eventually. And I opened up a small portion of my curtain so I could see out. And it's staring back at me. The one I saw on the road had red eyes, but this one distinctly had yellow eyes. But there was a full moon on this night, and it wasn't the night I'd seen it on the road. Um, it was a lot darker out. So I don't know if that played anything about it. I don't know if it's the same creature, if it was the same one or a different one. But this one seemed to me, and it might have been because it was much closer to me, it seemed absolutely humongous. It, it looked like a werewolf on steroids. It was almost all black, but these little um, streaks of either like grayish or white. Like I said, it, I, it's a full moon, so it was, the color was really hard to tell where it was grayish or white. But you could see it was like on the tips of this black. It had really long claws and pads. It actually had pads on its hands. And that kind of freaked me out because that was leading me more to, okay, it's a, it's a werewolf. And we locked eyes for a few seconds. 
And then I, I dropped the curtain and went back and was just sitting on the bed and praying for it to go away. But before I did that, I had already, and it, you could hear it. The wood on the porch cracked and it dropped down. And then and suddenly it dropped right because that's where it was standing from my point of view. And it just opens up the gate, walks out and jumps off the porch. The fact they knew how to open the gate, it just took one finger and lifted it up and walked out. It could have stepped over the gate, but no, it lifted it up and walked out and jumped off. Up until then, I, I was still holding out that it was just a really weird looking bear. But no, 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 that, that pretty much took care of that. It was not a weird looking bear. It, it, was, it was something I'd never seen before that close. And I was terrified because of how much like a werewolf it actually looked like. Its head in comparison to its body was small. It had these huge teeth. And I got a good look at the teeth this time. And they were definitely canine teeth. The incisors itself is the ones that scare me the most, the ones next to it, because of how big they were. But its head did not seem proportionate to its body at all. I mean, its body was pretty massive. Um, its its arms, from and, and that part still blows my mind, because they look more like arms than paws, at least until you get down to, to the hands. They look like they were bigger than my thighs. Now, mentally, I'm not a big person. I don't... I'm not exactly tiny in weight, so it kind of freaked me out. And the yellow eyes and the way they just kind of seemed to glow, they, they held my attention the most until it put its little paw up there, and it's not so little, but it had those pads on it, and that left an impression. So the next day, I looked at all the damage it had done when it was on the porch because it postured a lot. It threw things off the porch. It broke a mirror. It was angry. It was so aggressive, which is why I needed to prove to myself that it wasn't what I thought it was. And then it turns out to be exactly what I think it is. Well, not exactly. I thought it was a werewolf, but you know what I mean. And um, it's so hard for me to even talk about this. I'm almost in tears just talking about it because my heart's racing. I went outside and I found its tracks. I found for where it was walking bipedal to what looked like it dropped in all fours. It had this weird 35 to 45 degree angle. Its, its paws were bigger than my feet. I have a size um, five and a half foot, and this thing is bigger than that. Just barely, but still it was bigger. And then it looked like just before it, the tree, it um, had dropped down to four and came up. Um, there was something about when it had its paw on the window though there for those few seconds that um seemed different than a dog and it took a lot to to work that through um but it it, it left me very terrified um i i stopped going outside even downstairs to um go out for my nightly nicotine indulgence without taking a flashlight and searching everything but i have this this feeling like it was just gonna come around the corner any second and I'd be toast. Um, I couldn't seem to relax in the house. And then we started having mutilated animals show up. And um, they weren't like really like, um, it's just like leftovers for lack of a better term. And um, we could hear heavy footsteps walking across this, the roof um, at night. And I got so concerned that I did get my hunting rifle from my husband's house. And I put it underneath my bed um, there. But that was after I had moved back downstairs when the lady who had previously been there passed away. And um, I had my room back. It's just like whatever the dogman's intentions were, he had staked a claim on, on that side of the loft because there's another loft apartment on the other side that my son was in, and it never bothered him. He never saw it. Eventually, things got bad enough. We cut the tree down. The last straw for me, the absolute last straw for me, was finding that mountain lion torn to crap. And I was going to go get Grandma show her the mountain lion so she'd finally be convinced it wasn't a skunk walking across the roof at night. Turn back, and part of it was gone. And I was like, okay, where'd it go? I think it was the first time it clicked upstairs. Those two experiences in West Virginia, the two here, same animal. I saw the other two 
One was kind of towards dusk. The other one was during the afternoon. These two were at night. This animal can come out during the day. And that's when I got really scared and said, I am not staying here. I am moving away. And so I did. I moved to Phoenix for two years. But my heart belongs up here. I love people up here. There's so much beauty and um, a calmness, a sort of laid backness. But at nighttime, still, there's that, that little bit of fear that's left. And like I said, I'm still having nightmares. I thought I had a therapeutic way of releasing it by writing about my experience. And it helped some. I got mail from other people who have experienced this type of encounters. And um, it's helping me to process more what I went through and to accept it for what it is and try to move on with a little less fear and a little bit more um, acceptance that, okay, they exist, be respectful of them, and um, just try to do the best you can for now. I don't know how else to say it. One of the things that we had discussed previously is that at any one of those counters, if they had wanted to actually get to me, they easily could have. So obviously that was not their intent. If their intent was to scare me, they did an amazing job. It worked really good because I, I'm, I'm still a little bit afraid of the dark now. Well, after the experiences you had, that's totally understandable. Have you seen any dogman illustrations that closely resemble any of the dogmen you saw? I did. Um, the one here that I'm looking at now looks kind of like the one that was on the porch. Except for the tail. The tail is wrong. It actually had a tail, but it was more narrow. Um, it didn't have as much fluff to it. And it's very tiny in the waistline. The legs are very accurate. The arms are a bit more buff, but the, the head is so accurate, it scares me just looking at it. I saw an illustration, and it was actually caught on video. A guy trying to call a coyote. Sent out a coyote thing, and the thing that showed up looked exactly like the thing I saw in West Virginia. I only saw it a few times on, on YouTube, but it fascinated me enough that I was trying to figure out how to keep that because I definitely don't think that was a man in a mask. Um, that looked pretty, pretty accurate to what I had seen out in the woods there, just as this one does here. So they're definitely two different species of the two different types of the same species. But the uh, the hyena one just doesn't seem as aggressive as this one does. This one here than the picture was. But the one on the road didn't seem to try to hurt me at all. It just wouldn't let me know I'm not getting its deer. I mean, I seriously think that's what it was thinking. Is okay, I got my deer. Now you go away. Because it didn't growl at me. It didn't make a lot of noises. It just took the deer off the truck. And why not? I mean, I hit it with enough force. It knocked itself stupid. Natural selection being what it is. It's a shame, too. It was a nice six-pointer. So those are the only two I can really think of that would actually meet the descriptions. But like I said, from everything I've seen about them so far, one thing I am convinced of, they're intelligent creatures. They're not stupid. Even some of the stories that people relate have related to me, one of the reasons I believe them is because of the intelligence that the creature showed combined with the animal instinct. That led me to believe it. I've also read stories where I'm like, hmm, I'm not so sure. That doesn't sound reasonable. Yeah, that's one of the things that makes them so creepy, the fact that they are so intelligent. You said that the first one you saw had features like a hyena and had spots. Was there any particular pattern to its spots? I noticed it more on the face than on the body, but I was still kind of like looking at it. I primarily was looking at the face until it stood up because I, was, I didn't know what to think about it. It looked like a dog on all fours except for his arms were wrong. I mean, the front paws were wrong because they had like paws on them. But the face, from what I could tell, had a series of spots, but they didn't seem like they were in a particular pattern for its to me but I was really young and I wasn't really aware of such patterns then unless they were um, applied to sharks oh sure yeah as young as you were back then 
you were doing good to know your own name after having an experience like that. So, no, I totally understand. It sounded to me like you're having a great time the day you had your second encounter. That is up until the point where that dogman ruined the experience for you. That really is a shame. Did that second dogman frighten you more or less than the first one that you saw? The first one actually had me more curious at first than frightened until it stood up on, on just his two legs. It's like, holy moly, that's a big guy. But the second one, I didn't know if it was the first one or not until it stood up, until I realized how far up it was. And the first one was so much smaller. Because when it stood up, it was only between six, six and a half feet tall. Maybe not even that big. But this one was definitely much bigger and stockier, too. And the fur seemed to be longer, but it was starting to turn into fall too. So I don't know how that plays into it. But like I said, after that account, I got sent home. So I absolutely refused to leave the house. I was being completely unreasonable, but I was young and I was stupid. I could have just as easily come across a bear or a mountain lion in that area. And obviously a turkey, because I did come across a turkey. It scared it out of the woods. But a lot of times when I'm back home in West Virginia now, and animals suddenly get scared out of the woods, I wonder if one of them's out there. I can be pretty, I don't want to say unreasonable, because I don't think it's unreasonable to pay attention to your surroundings. But you don't want to overdo it to the point where you're not enjoying your life. That's true. Yeah, there's balance in everything. At least there should be, that is. When you had your third encounter, how sure are you that the deer ran into your truck instead of actually being thrown into your truck by the dog man? Oh, I'm absolutely certain. He had his head turned back the way that they were fleeing from. And the next thing I know, he runs into it, bam. And then it comes around from the front of the truck. And I think it got up there because my mind was focused on the deer and not what was on front of my truck. Because of the way it just sneaked around. And then when it stood up to its full height, I stopped breathing. I was like, holy moly, this is big. This dude is somewhere between seven to eight feet tall. He probably was closer to the eight feet tall. And the other one couldn't stand up to its full height on the loft because it was extremely large too. So I don't know if we just bring them bigger out here or what, but I'm absolutely certain that the deer hit the truck. They looked like they were running for their lives and considering how it turned out, I guess that's pretty accurate. The reason why I asked you about that is I don't think the deer ran into your truck. Being a country girl the way you are, I'm sure you know, I'm sure it's not lost on you that when an ungulate runs, they can't turn their heads. Their necks are locked in a straight position. So when you said that its head was turned when it hit your truck, that makes me think that more than likely the dogman actually threw it. And that's why its neck was bent when it hit your truck. I could be wrong about that. Somehow, some way. Maybe it did have its head turned when it was running because maybe it was slowing down enough where it could do that physically. But under normal circumstances, a deer can't do that. A deer can't turn its head when it's running. But having said that, your fourth encounter obviously shook you up quite a bit more than the first three. Why was it that that experience shook you up so much? Well, for one thing, I felt like I was living a scene in Silver Bullet. And two... That area up there is so flimsy. If it wanted in, it would have gotten in. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind. I have no idea why it stopped. I mean, it was extremely aggressive. I have no idea why it didn't just come on in through the door. I've often wondered that. And, that, and that, that's the basis of a lot of my nightmares, that's, that it makes it through the door. It always makes it through the door in my nightmares. But in reality, it did not come through that door. It did not come through the windows, and it could have. If it had wanted to, something that big could have easily have come through. But I also don't know how much of that had to do with the porch breaking. I mean, it cost me $1,300 to replace that porch. Because when I replaced that one, I placed the downstairs one, and the one on the other side did all look the same. I think what is most terrifying um, for me, especially that night, was that sudden realization of how vulnerable I really was up there. I never felt that way before. When we moved into this house, I thought, just like you said, one of the things I was thinking about is how easy it would be for them to come through these walls because they're not that thick. And I don't want to leave my dogs outside. Things like that. Just be cautious and try to 
show these animals as much respect as possible and hope for the best. I would like to know more about them. I'm very curious about them. I'd like to hear more stories about them and things like that. I would love to write more books about them. They fascinate me now. But at the same time, I'm, I'm still kind of scared. And I want that fear to not be as bad as it was, which in a lot of ways it is. You know, I can wake up from the nightmare and say, if I wanted in, it would have gotten me. But two, I wonder why me, of all people, would have four encounters. I mean, I live the most ordinary <laughs> life as possible. And I have to remember that m for me, a huge part of my life is being outdoors. And um, I think the worst thing I've came up to before then was a bear and um, a bear that had mange. A really, really bad case of mange. But still, I live my life outdoors and I don't want to be afraid anymore. And I refuse to be af uh, afraid. Well, considering the fact that you like to live your life outdoors, don't lose sight of the fact that I'm sure more times than you could shake a stick at when you're out in the woods or outside or wherever out there, it was watching you. It had full access to you out there, just like it had full access to you in the house, but it never harmed you. So please don't lose sight of that fact. No, I don't plan on losing sight of that fact again. I, I'm just grateful that I had this experience in some ways. Because I put it on the back of my book, but it scared me to the truth of their existence. And from the dog man, I've explored more of the stories I've heard about sound squatches and other cryptids like the skunk ape. Because I lived in Florida for a number of years. And I always heard about him coming after the hurricanes. Because food would be more plentiful there. Of course, most of the food would be dead food. But still, they talk about the skunk ape cleaning up after the storm. I grew up with stories like that. And Wendigos, Native American legends about Wendigos. So for me to have an encounter with a cryptid, especially four, in a way is kind of a, an honor. And in an, another way, even though it terrified me to death, it makes me wonder how much of these other cryptids are reality. You had four encounters with dogmen and not one of them left you harmed. Please do remember that also. You mentioned the Dogman-related book you wrote, Christine. Please tell us where we can buy it. It's available on Amazon in both paperback and on the Kindle Unlimited. All proceeds from the book sales are not going to me personally. They're going to support my local fire department, Mayor Fire Department here in Mayor. I'm hoping to earn enough money to pay for their new turnout so that they'll be safe. So far this summer, they have fought 35 different fires, including other states. They've been on call for other states. And a small portion goes to St. Jude's because I'm internally grateful to them for all the things that they've done for this family. The book has some details that are different than what I've shared with you to protect the people who I was visiting with and the strange things that went on before and after. I've never been able to prove or disprove those things. I didn't put them in the book. There was also an account from two other sources on there. One did not want to be revealed, so I changed it up and switched it to my husband's account, but it's actually hers. And then another one was just weird. What's the name of your book? Oh, I should have chosen a better name for it. It's called Nightmare in the Woods, and it's under Christine Ann. A C H R I S T Y N E, and the Ann is A N N E. It's actually my birth name, um, as it was properly spelled on my birth certificate before I was adopted in 1972. Yeah, you don't see that spelling all that often. I like that. Well, Christine, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. No problem. I'm happy to share it. Um, I hope that people will hear my story and it will take away some of their fear when trying to rationalize their experiences with dogmen because at any point on any of those four encounters, I could have been toast. But I walked away from them. I'm still here and I'm still enjoying the woods. Well, I hope that never changes. And also so that you know and so that everyone listening knows, I'm going to post that book, a link for that book, on dogmanencounters.com. There's a section for media, recommended reading, and things like that. 
Yeah, I'm going to post a link for your book there so that people can easily click on that link and find it that way. But thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a Dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.